Um, hi. I'll hi. Keep, I Can will... you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Great. Can you hear us? Absolutely perfectly. Awesome. Yep. I... Great. So uh, I'll give you the floor for the presentation and everything, and then th there will be a Q&A moment after your presentation. And I will be very strict with the time, which is okay. 20, 40 minutes. So you have 40 minutes, 40 and I minutes. will jump in if you <laughs> like run out of time. So the floor is okay, yours. Great. Bye. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's uh, fabulous to be here. I'm going to um, share my screen here. What I um, what I want to talk about today is really two separate projects. One is um, just an idea I've been playing with a long time. When you think about something like inequality, there's so many models out there, and it almost makes, I think, a lot of sense to look at it through many, many lenses. So I want to give spend about 15 minutes just walking through the many different ways that economists and social scientists have looked at inequality. Then what I want to do is I want to construct a very simple model of structural inequality to show really just two points. One, that looking at means can be really misleading. And the other is, is that oftentimes we have these interventions and there's a whole science of implementation science where we try something and it works and then we take it someplace else and it doesn't work. And also in the long term, it doesn't work. And I think that's because these systems are incredibly robust and they sort of pull themselves back. So I want to construct a very simple model of structural inequality based primarily on the work of Rob Sampson out of Harvard. Okay, so quick, not that people need to know this, but just as a reminder, right, we have kind of just enormous wealth inequality in the United States. And whether you look across the US or Europe or Western Europe, you see that the top 10% of earners just earn a large percentage of that money. So why? What I want to do is I want to walk through 10 models very, very quickly just to kind of let them wash over you to give you a sense of all the different ways and causes that we think exist for this level of inequality. So the first model is just a simple econophysics model. And this says that random exchanges are gonna produce skewed income distributions. So these kind of 10 models up on top here, the first one is this. If we just imagine that we create a system with a bunch of people who randomly trade with one another, what we won't get is a normal distribution. What we will get is a Boltzmann distribution. And so what these models look like, and this is one by Dragulescu and Yakovenko, you just assume that there's a total amount of money in the economy, people bump into each other, one person wins a dollar, one person loses a dollar. And what you get from that isn't a normal distribution. And I think this is incredibly important to know. Economists tend to dismiss this sort of model, but I actually think of it as profoundly important because it essentially says the fundamental physics of exchange lead to substantial levels of inequality, okay? Second model, and this would be kind of like the standard econ model, is that there's really kind of a race between technology and labor. So what happens is a new technology comes along, chat GPT being an example, um, it's gonna be labor saving. What that's gonna do is that's gonna increase the relative value of educated workers typically. And so what you see over time, and this is a time series for US data from 1963 to 2010, that you see that kind of like the value of going to graduate school goes up and down, the value of being a college graduate goes up and down. And these are all due to this kind of like race between technological advances and then people getting educated. And so the models here are really straightforward. You've got a constant A, which comes from a standard solo growth model. Then you've got coefficients on capital. So K is capital. Then there's returns to high skill and low skill labor, these beta and this gamma. And there's just a simple technological advantage parameter depending on the state of current technology. And so as that shifts, as beta gets bigger, more people move into high skilled jobs, inequality goes down, beta gets bigger again, inequality goes up. And it's this, this constant race between people sort of increasing their education levels and changes in technology. Now, third model, which is that, well, that's that model is kind of static. And if you look at who really makes a lot of money, oftentimes it's people who create new industries. You know, you think of the um, Jeff Bezos, you think of Bill Gates, right? And so what you could think of is ability translating into a rate of learning. And then what's happening is ability variation is explaining the long tail. So if you look at any particular job, one of the things that's kind of amazing, and this is just airline pilots, that we've seen a skew in the distribution. So there's, you know, so there's inequality at the national level, but there's also inequality among college professors, airline pilots, um, accountants, lawyers. Every single profession has had this increase in inequality. 
Now, these are models by uh, Professor Jones out of Stanford. You used to imagine each person has an ability A, but instead of thinking of that as like high skill and low skill, like the previous model, what you could think of is that like my in A is like my ability to learn. And so my income in year T equals some constant, which is the base year income, times one plus A raised to the power T. So what happens is, is if I just kind of learn more and continue to grow, my I'm gonna grow at a rate A, and if somebody else has a higher rate of learning, they're gonna grow faster. And so what we're seeing is just the compounding of people who sort of continue to accumulate capital. And again, there's strong empirical support for the fact that the people who make a lot of money are people who continue to sort of grow and learn. And one way to think about this is the rule of 72, which is something that accountants use all the time. If your income grows at a rate R, it doubles in 72 over R years. So if two people initially were earning $50,000 and you look 36 years later, person who grew at a 2% increase in making $100,000, the person who grew at a 6% increase would be making $400,000. So this is just kind of a, a simple doubling sort of argument based on talent. Now, a fourth model that's similar to that and comes more from biology, and I think you've seen some, I think Louise Betancourt, I think has probably shown some stuff like this, is that social status correlates with higher growth in this human capital. So that previous model just sort of says some people have high A's, some people have lower A's, and that's what explains differences. But what you can imagine is, think of this like a biological growth model. So I've got a total amount of energy, and that energy can go into two things. It can go into maintenance, or it can go into growth. And so the growth parameter here, G, is like the A from the previous model. Now, what's causing the inequality here is more structural in the sense that if I have to spend a lot of time on maintenance, I can't spend that much time on growth. So let's imagine two people. One person's born without much social status, and so they've got to pay for their car, they've got to pay for rent, maybe they're living a long way from downtown, so their maintenance costs are really, really high. Someone else has a lot of family support, high social status, so their parents buy them a car, their parents buy them an apartment, their parents you know, pay for somebody to give them childcare, right? So their maintenance costs are a lot lower because their maintenance costs are lower, their growth rate can be six, whereas the other person's growth rate is two, even though right, they've got the same fundamental energy level. So what this is doing is sort of showing how inequality can manifest itself over generations, because once you've accumulated status and wealth, you lower your maintenance costs and that allows your growth rate to be higher. And again, articles on this all the time, a secret of many urban 20-somethings is their parents help with the rent, allowing them to live closer to work, lowering their maintenance costs. Okay, model five. Now let's go sociology, right? So those have been kind of like physics models, economics models. Let's go to a sociological model. And this one actually has um, maybe the most empirical support out of all of this, it's just a standard preferential attachment model, social effects lead to big winners. So a socially constructed superstar model, this is a standard preferential attachment model. I can buy from one pro I can buy one product or another. I'm more likely to buy things that other people buy, right? And so this is the famous music lab experiment by Salganik and Watts and others. If people don't see the songs that other people download, this is kind of the, the songs along the axis, the horizontal axis and the number of downloads on the vertical axis. This, if we plotted it differently, would look pretty much like a normal distribution. Some songs do a little bit better, some songs do a little bit worse. But once I know which songs other people are listening to, then we get this long tail distribution. Now this is an inverted long tail with the, the high bars, the lots of sales. And so what you see is if people buy things in sort of a social setting and were influenced by other people, then you're gonna get winners and losers and you're gonna get a winner take all economy. I mean, the story that economists like to tell in this sort of context is no one other than economist goes to a bar and says, give me your second best champagne or give me your second best steak, right? We tend to sort of want the best. We want the thing that other people want. And that leads to sort of extra marginal returns. Stories so far have all been kind of like micro based and haven't had any sort of, um, you know, sort of elite that are manipulating a system. Um, model six is a model, you know, put forth by Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, and it's in his book on inequality, and it's a spatial voting model. And the idea here is people at the high end of the distribution do so. They, they, they continue to make huge wages and salaries by manipulating the system. And so if you look at the ratio of 
the CEO pay to average worker pay in the United States, it's 400 times, which is much higher. In other countries, it's lower. And when you saw the data before, the US had an incredibly high um, level of income inequality compared to other countries, especially in the top 1%. This is, this is Stiglitz's argument. And here's kind of quite simply how it works. Suppose we have three people on a committee deciding how much the CEO should get paid as a proportion of the average worker. And there's three people on the board. Right. The board has two CEOs, and then it has X, which is an external consultant. So the external consultant says, look, you should probably make about 35 times what the average worker pays. But the two CEOs who also want their salaries to be high, they're like, no, 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 no. You should be paid 250 times, 300 times what people get paid, what the average worker gets paid. So when we vote on this, a spatial voting model will say, well, the median voter decides. So the median voter here is CEO number one. And so CEO number one carries the day and the CEO of this company gets paid 250 times the average worker. Now let's go down to the bottom graph, which would represent a country like Germany or a Scandinavian country where there's workers on the board. Now there's three people on the board. There's CEO one, there's a, which is another CEO from a different country company. There's X, which is the outside consultant, the expert. And then there's W, the worker. When I replace the CEO with the worker, what I do is I now make the outside expert, we can assume is somewhat objective, as the median voter. And so now the CE only, get, CE only gets 35 times the average pay of a worker. So Stiglitz's argument is when you think of a lot of wages are not set in markets and they're set by committees, right? University salaries are set by committees. And then we compete with other universities who set things by committees. And that whole system can get corrupted by people within the inside and amplify salaries for elites. This has certainly been true of university presidents in the United States. Um, when I first became a professor 30 years ago, university professors or um, university presidents made a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now they make several million dollars. Okay, model seven, going back now, going back to sociology. This one has a lot of empirical support. I mean, if you, if you do a horse race between them, about five years ago, this one, when I checked this last, this one kind of wins. And this is a simple assortative mating argument. Highly educated people are now much more likely to marry, which increases inequality. So if you look at educational assortative mating, whether you're looking in the US or in Europe, what you see is the share of all couples where both have a college degree is going way, way up. Now, this is an incredibly simple model. If you look at this, I kind of love this when I present it to my undergrads. It's like income of the family equals the income of one spouse plus the income of the other spouse. Now, this is done in kind of a heteronormative model where it's a man and a woman. But in any family, right, if you've got a, if you've got a married couple, the income is the sum of those incomes. If highly educated people are more likely to hire, marry highly educated people, you're just summing two higher incomes. Okay. Model eight, um, the famous Piketty model, right? Some of the highest incomes comes from capital rents and always will. And what you get is that the rents on capital are higher than the growth rate. Right, so this is a very deep model. Return on capital is higher than the growth rate, and if you look at capital income over time from 19, he Piketty in his book goes back to the 17th century, but if you just look at sort of capital gains and capital income, they're a huge percentage, half of the top 0.1 percent income share. And so this is just once you have wealth, you continue to accumulate wealth, and so the the more sophisticated model here is like the growth in wealth depends on the return on capital minus the tax rate, minus the consumption rate. So if you have enough money that you're not, it's not getting taxed and consumed away, you're gonna grow faster than the growth rate of the economy and you're gonna continue to um, accumulate money. Okay, model nine, and now we're getting kind of more into the structural inequality stuff that I'm gonna build to, so I'll slow down a tiny bit. These are an income dynamics model. So what you think is that incomes persist across families, not only due to wealth, but also due to transfers of skills. So this is a, a wonderful chart by Gregory Clark from his uh, book, The Sun Also Rises, where if you look at the top, look at names and their probability of attending Harvard. So if your name's like Eleanor, Peter, Simon, Catherine, Elizabeth, Anglo-Saxon names, you're three, threefold is likely to go to Oxford. If you live in England and you have an Irish name like Jade or Page <laughs> or Shannon or Shane, your odds are like 150th is likely. And so this is getting it, it's, you can't make an argument that people who have of Irish descent are less intelligent than people of British descent, but you can make an argument that social capital is getting passed on in such a way that some people have a much higher chance of attending these elite schools 
than others. And so these simple models that are going on is that you're just, it's, these are written typically as just Markov models where there's parents and there's children and these sort of soft skills are getting passed from one parent to the other. And so you can just kind of write this giant Markov model and then you get that these systems end up having this really, really slow transition um, in terms of social mobility. Okay, last model, and then I'm gonna get into something kind of in more detail, are these persistent inequality models. So this is the segregation creates poverty traps for economic, sociological, and psychological reasons. If you look in the United States, and this isn't by race, this is just by income. This is Washington, DC. Low income people are concentrated in one area. Higher income people are concentrated in another area and middle income people kind of form a belt between them. If you look at the share of low income households residing in majority low income census tracts in our major cities, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, right? It's 30%, right? If you look, it's actually the transitions out of poverty are actually higher in places like Atlanta, Boston, San Francisco, which doesn't show up on this chart because people who live in low income areas are sur aren't surrounded by other low income people. And what, and there's evidence that in terms of like, just even like sort of environmental stress, stress from violence, quality of schools, access to opportunity, all those things improve if you're not surrounded by other low income people. So these simple models, and this is one I'm gonna go into kind of in more detail in a second, your income depends on kind of your ability, your education and these spillovers and these spillover effects are everything from like, you know, health to peer effects, to crime, to stress, to environmental effects. So I, I'm not actually happy with the word spillover, even though this is what the economists tend to use. You might think instead of these as some as, as more systemic effects. So quick summary, and, and um, in my book, The Model Thinker, in the, the book is basically a compendium of a whole bunch of models. Um, the last chapter looks at um, income inequality, also looks at COVID and some other stuff, and walks through, you can you can get a recapitulation of all these arguments. But but the point I want to get across is when you look at something like income inequality, it's so easy for someone to say, this is the reason. And in reality, <clears throat> there's many reasons, right? There's naturally just a skew. There's just the basic economics of technology and labor. There is increasing returns to ability. There is this structural inequality that comes in because of maintenance of growth. There are superstar effects. The system is manipulated. Assorted mating, especially by education, is causing an increase in inequality. It is the fact that wealth accumulates faster than the growth rate of the economy. It's also true that there's these social things passed on from families, right, that enable you to sort of have these soft skills to do better, right, as Gregory Clark says in his book, The Sun Also Rises. And there are these education and social forces and persistent inequality in these poverty traps that don't let people get out. So how do we think about modeling there being multiple courses, causes? And I wanna just in some sense go back to that last model. And I wanna take this, some of this work by Rob Sampson, where he says, look, there's neighborhood effects, there's these high order effects, and there's individual actors operating within these different sort of structures and they all kind of feed on one another. But what I wanna do is I wanna go beyond just having some sort of picture and construct kind of a model, not as sophisticated as this, but that kind of has these parts. So this is a, a graph I'm really, fond of. It's by the Foresight Group out of England. And it just shows all the causes of obesity. And I'll, I'll dial in a bit. All those different colors are really different academic disciplines. And so some of the things we've heard um, earlier in this conference is that we can't really just be inside our silos. Because if you're in, if you look at this whole graph, all these colors are all interconnected. So you can't carve nature at its joints and solve each one of those and hope to solve the system. Because this entire system is kind of feeding back on itself. So let me sort of show how that can work in a model. So I'm gonna construct an incredibly simple model. Each of these dots is a person. And I wanna think of two broad dimensions of how well some is, someone is doing. One, I wanna think of socioeconomic. The other one I think of is health. And I wanna think of health broadly defined. So you can think of this as physical health as well as mental health. So what I've got is I've got just a scatter shot to begin with, right? So there's a distribution on each of these two parameters and there's a mean there. Now, one could have separable additive thinking. So I could think of things like health status, where there's lead exposure, diet, exercise, stress, disease, those sorts of things. And I could think of socioeconomic status depending on school quality, family, infrastructure, local economy, and crime and community policing policies, right? And 
what I could do, which people have done now for the last 60 years, is I could run a regression on health as a function of all these different things. And what I could do then is I could say, well, if I put somebody in a poor community, what's going to happen is that distribution is just going to kind of slide down, right, in this direction. And I'm going to end up with a community in which people are of kind of poor health, relatively speaking, and poor socioeconomic status. And then what I think, and this is completely well-intentioned, if I'm a health economist, or I work in community-oriented health, look, if I get the lead out of the water, if I improve people's diets, if I help people exercise and get rid of stress, I'm going to lift up this society. But this separable thinking here works out of the assumption that like, this isn't going to have that much of a socioeconomic effect necessarily immediately because I'm just, I'm only improving on the health dimension. And then I think what I also want to do is I want a kind of a full slate of activities. So I want to also improve school quality, infrastructure, local economy, crime and community policing. And so now I'm going to move in both directions. So I can move this way and then I can move this way and everything's better than my policy works. The challenge here is that we've got like 50 years of showing that this hasn't worked, right? We haven't been successful. And the reason why is this is a system. So let me, let me start out. I'm going to construct the system kind of slowly. So let's suppose I start with, this is just kind of a loop gif here. I'm starting with that scatter scott distribution of socioeconomic status and health status. If it's the case that health status affects socioeconomic status, what that does is that pivots the distribution, right? Because if I have high health, I'm up here in high health, then my socioeconomic status gets better. If I'm poor health, my socioeconomic status gets worse. So it's just pushing the graph like this, or maybe it's like this, depending on how I'm being reflected in Zoom. If in turn, socioeconomic status affects health status, that's going to push the people who are high socioeconomic status into higher health, people who are low socioeconomic status into lower health, and that's pivoting the graph this way. Well, when I put both of those in, they amplify each other. So one is pushing like this, one is pushing like that, and the system very quickly moves sideways. So when you look at this, and what's important to look at is look at the two green lines. Those are tracking the trajectories of two randomly chosen members of the population. What you see is that I'm getting a narrowing, so I'm getting a, a huge correlation, incredibly strong correlation between socioeconomic well-being and health well-being, right? That's I'm almost getting a 45-degree line. I'm also seeing one trajectory where the person who starts a little bit ahead on each is actually doing better. The person who's starting a little bit worse on each is doing worse, and the mean doesn't change. The blue dot is not moving, right? So I've set this thing up so nothing is happening to the mean, but the distribution is changing like crazy, and when we look at this distribution, this is, a, this is actually just showing increases in health disparities and increases in socioeconomic status disparities that are mutually self-reinforcing. But we also know that there's kind of self-reinforcing loops within each one of these. So let's suppose socioeconomic status kind of has a positive feedback with socioeconomic status or negative feedback with socioeconomic status. So if I've got Above average socioeconomic status, I'm going to do better. That's like that model we had with the A being positive. And if I'm below, I'm going to do worse. So now look at the two green lines. The person who's got above socio high above mean socioeconomic status, even though they've got poor health, they're moving up. The person who's got very good health but low socioeconomic status, they're moving down. So what's happening here, that positive feedback or that self-reinforcement is pulling the socioeconomic status line apart, which is another force for increasing inequality. So previously we saw these, if these two things self-reinforce one another, that's gonna cause the whole system to just kind of like skew toward a 45 degree line and increase inequality. Positive feedbacks with each one of these is gonna push things to the side. Now, one of the things we talked about, or I talked about, <laughs> you listened about, I guess, before, is there's huge peer effects in these models as well, right? So if I'm surrounded by people who are doing well, I'm more likely to do well. And if I'm surrounded by people who don't do well, I'm less likely to do well. So if I throw a peer effect in just on the socioeconomic status, not on the health status, and I assume that like, if someone's close to me, I become somewhat more like them. What that's going to do is that's going to create these bundles. And it creates, in this particular case, just the way I've set this up, it turns out I get, most of the time I get like three groups. I get kind of a middle group, a high group, and a low group. But notice again, the mean it bumps around a little bit, but it doesn't change because people are kind of averaging people near them. So the effect of peer effects isn't so much to increase inequality, but to create clusters of inequality. 
But when I throw in the peer effect plus the socioeconomic status loop, watch what happens, right? I'm getting the, the clusters again, but now the one in the middle just kind of stays in the middle and the one at the bottom moves to the left and the one at the top moves to the right. So the peer effect plus the socioeconomic status loop gives us a particular form of increasing inequality. Let's go to health. So this is a lead, right? And if we decrease lead, you'd think, okay, we should improve situations in the society. Even if, we, if lead is in the water, things should get worse. So let's suppose there's a negative environmental effect. Now, again, if I think of the world in terms of, um, you know, just things being kind of linear, then what's going to happen is when I have this negative environmental effect, the health of everyone in that community is going to get worse. But this is, notice I've I've stripped away all of the other stuff. And so the mean here is going down, but realize that by trying to carve nature at its joints, we have to think this just can't be the right way to think about this, right? So what if I throw in, we'll leave out the pure effects for a second, the health status affecting socioeconomic status, socioeconomic status affecting health status, positive feedbacks in health status. Now, when I throw in that environmental effect, right, I'm getting all, I'm getting the, the positive feedback loops between the two, getting things on the 45 degree line, I've got the environmental effect pulling things down. Suddenly I get the whole system heading towards the corner, right? So before I thought of health effect as just a health effect, as terrible as that may be, it's just kind of pulling the whole system down relatively slowly. But when I throw in the feedbacks in the system, it's pulling the system kind of, it's almost like looping it down into the corner. And so the environmental effect not only has an effect on health status, it has an effect on socioeconomic status, which in turn has an effect on health status. And then we get in this kind of vicious loop. And here we see that mean just racing towards the left, lower left-hand corner. Whereas when we had a linear view of things, we just see that mean heading straight down. Okay, now if I add in, right, the peer effect, then what happens is I'm still getting this clustering, right? But the environmental effect has the effect of taking two of those three clusters and pulling those towards the corner, but yet still allowing one cluster to kind of make it out. I purposefully chose this particular green dot in this example, because this green dot is someone who starts out above average socioeconomic health and above average um, or socioeconomic status and above average health. But yet because they make a set of friends that are a little bit below, they start heading to the left and then that environmental effect pulls them down and they do worse. Now, one of the things that I really want to sort of drive home in looking at these things is each one of these dots you can think of as a person who has a story that is a narrative. And so it's very easy to look at a picture like this and follow a red dot that kind of makes its way out. In fact, there's a lot of red dots that make their way out. So even though this is a system that starts out kind of in an okay place and has a negative environmental effect through peer effects and through positive loops, there's a bunch of red dots that do really, really well. And so that allows us to tell stories about people who make it and say, no, look, it's just hard work, it's education, it's finding the right friends, you can make it. That's true, you can make it, but like 10% of the people can make it. Most of the people are being sucked into this vortex into the bottom left-hand corner. So you can think, okay, let's have a health intervention. Let's come in, you know, the system isn't doing well, so let's intervene on health. The thing is, if the health intervention, even if it more than offsets the environmental effect, once we're down in that corner, the low health status is feeding into the economic status and into the health status, and we're just not gonna make our way out of it, right? And you can think, what if we do both an intervention for health and an intervention on socioeconomic status? If it's not high enough, if it's not strong enough, the system is still, I mean, here you see the system kind of stagnates a little bit. We're kind of fighting the system a little bit and we are seeing a couple people make it out. Um, but generally now here, all we're doing is consolidating the entire system down in the lower left-hand corner. So point I wanna make is that when you look at these systems, right, we wanna think of there being all these different effects that are in play and even though this is a very simple logic and it won't be something that's surprising to anyone in this room, it's I think I found this simple model is probably the best way to communicate this to people. You wanna think of these, the health status, the environmental status, the socioeconomic forces 
as having this gravitational pull for the entire society, right? And so this red dot is again kind of representing the mean, and I and I want to be thinking of us in terms of systems of agents. But when I have some sort of intervention, I'm pushing things up the basin. The problem is the ball sort of falls back, right? So do this fancy simulation one more time, right? I start here, but then the system just kind of pulls back. And so the way to think about this is that if I have a policy intervention in this sort of system, if I were to think of things as being separable, then the larger the policy intervention, the larger the effect, right? And this is the kind of thing we do in empirical research. We say, oh, we had this, we did this simulation, you know, we did this intervention, we had this effect. If it's systemic, even though we might see a, an effect initially, it's just gonna get pulled right back down to the bottom of the basin. And what you see is there's gonna be thresholds for the size of effects you need. So if you think of these things as complex adaptive systems, I'm sounding a lot like Donatello Meadows here, right? With these positive feedback loops, right? And these kind of also these sort of direct feedback, these direct effects that are pulling things down, you're gonna need policy interventions that have sufficient magnitude to kind of get out of that basin. So the goal here is escape velocity. So what I did again in this very simple model is I tweaked the health intervention and the socioeconomic status intervention to make them just high enough, just high enough so that the system could make its way out. But if you watch the pattern on this, it's kind of funny because you get this kind of coalescing. It doesn't seem to work that well at the beginning. It's, it's just kind of getting there and it kind of coalesces and you're kind of pulling everybody up a bit and then you get this kind of pathway out. So if I continued to run this, you'd see the whole system um, go. But if you watch like the green dot, it's just moving around, not a lot is happening. But the thing is, generally we're getting people on this 45 degree line, it's slowly starting to go. And then once they get above a sort of combined threshold on those things, there's this kind of pathway out of poverty. What I like about this particular simulation, if I were to go back to the Rob Sampson story, this is a metaphor that's used all the time, right? That there's pathways out of poverty. And even if I go back to the simulations in which only a handful of people make it out, those people are still following similar sorts of pathways. So I want to just in kind of closing this part out, I want to be really clear that this is still super, this is more complex than we typically think about policy, but this is still incredibly simple compared to just that obesity graph that I showed at the beginning, and that's only dealing with health status. And the, part of the reason I gave the 10 models is when you think of the socioeconomic status and what's holding people back socioeconomically, there's 10 or 11 or 15 forces going on in there. And so what we really want to think of is there being many, many forces on health, many, many forces on the environment, many, many forces on community, many, many forces happening in, the, in economics. And those things create this gravity to a system. And we've got to think about then how do we get people out? So quick takeaway in systems thinking, and then some summaries, then I'll hopefully a lot of time for questions. So the first is watching these models, you want to look at distributions of means, because there's going to be people who make it out. There's going to be people who do poorly. There's going to be clustering. The implications of effects are not additive, right? We saw, and this is just kind of a simple building block kind of model as I kept adding more things, weird things were happening to the distribution, even though the mean isn't changing much. And it does appear, again, not a new idea here, but it's gonna take a sustained multiple focus approach to get the system out. Pulling one lever, people talk about lever points in these systems all the, point, all the time. Um, I, Colleague John Holland would have said that it's more like levers point. I mean, you want to many, you probably need many interventions to get these things out. Um, so last slide, there's a ton of causes of inequality and therefore there's many models of inequality. And it's really useful to look across all of those and think about how can I embed all of those inside a system and then think about how we get out of that system because the many causes aren't just, it's not a horse race between those causes, like mine is a bigger R squared than yours are, your R squared. What every one of those models is true to some extent, right? There's some ex amount of the variation they're explaining, there's some strength of that cause, and there's ways in which that cause is interacting with other causes, like we see in something like that obesity graph. The combination of all those effects is to create a system that unfortunately is really, really robust to intervention. And rather than see the system in equilibrium at the moment, I think I see the system as one in which, you know, inequality is kind of increasing. And so if you think about we're heading in a path that's increasing, the size of those interventions may have to be even larger than the ones I was showing you um, in the graphs. All right, so let me stop there and uh, open it up for questions.
Thank you very much. You were perfectly in time. You have five minutes left, so it's uh, it's going to be um, used for Q questions. I already see some hands raised, and I'm going to go down there and then like get back to the front. And I apologize. I couldn't be. We have a graduate student strike, and so we're uh, all of us have had uh, universities in a bit of turmoil here <laughs> at the moment. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I really, really found it interesting. Um, I totally agree that I think um, there are a lot, there are many, many factors which cause inequality, and they tend to work in these kind of continuous feedback loops. And um, that you know, the aim is really to disrupt. I think that feedback loop. Um, but some of Robert Sampson's work actually shows that even at a structural level, a very high level, you might have major change, sometimes at the neighborhood scale, neighborhoods persist in terms of uh, where, in looking at their trajectories and in terms of um, remaining with, uh, within, you know, in, within certain poverty levels. So I was wondering if it's maybe not necessarily the size of the disruption, but rather thinking about it in terms of scale and thinking about policies in terms of um, yeah, I, I just wanted your thoughts on that, and, and in terms of like multi-scale no, interventions. Is a, this is such a great question. So, um, Robert and I have been talking to people in Cincinnati about this in this project, and the way I've been thinking, about it, it's almost like a rectangle, right? There's kind of like, the, if you think of scale on this x and magnitude on this x, right? Like, if you go smaller, right, um, it can work. The question is, you know, what can you draw a box around and still have it work, right? So, like, could we go into one? Like, if you want to go into Cincinnati. What's the minimal size of a neighborhood that you could go into and actually have a positive effect? That's a really interesting kind of empirical and theoretical question to ask, right? Because you couldn't, we know you can't, the household is too small, right? And the entire city of Cincinnati might be just like too big in the sense that like, you know, you need, because things need to be targeted to specific communities. And I think, you know, some of the stuff that Luis shows, Betancourt, you know, where they do this much more micro level data of, um, you know, what's going on in cities and who makes it out where and who doesn't is the kind of thing we're trying to look at to think about, okay, where could you make the right sort of intervention? But the other thing that I think is really important, we're using some, some cool platforms like one called CrowdSmart, where we're having conversations with people in the community, is trying to get conversations between people who are ex-felons and people who dropped down and people who are doing well and people who are not, to figure out what is each person's, you know, each little dot in that thing, what is each person's path like? What's preventing them um, from being successful, but no, but you're absolutely right. I think it, this has to be place-based and um, and strategically, and also I think the the set of seven interventions that have to be done in this neighborhood are probably very likely different than the nine interventions that have to be done in that neighborhood. But it's a it's a really interesting question where you can draw those boundaries, and I think often if you're politically constrained. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, just want to ask uh, for the inequality models that we have presented, uh, which models should be used when, like in other words, when, when is the econophysics model better off than the other models? And then secondary, being new to the models, I also want to understand like which data sets are used to analyze such models. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a great, I mean, this is a really great, question. And when I was when I was writing the the many model book, I mean one of the things that I was just trying to start with is a very sort of simple observation, which is that if you look at sort of the total number of variables we have to measure in equality or anything, um, is enormous. And so the entropy of that entire system that we're trying to explain is huge. Any model that we can understand is going to be lower entropy. It's going to have less information content. And so what you want to have is you want to think of those models as kind of overlapping in all sorts of ways. So, you know, I, I referred to Plato carving nature at its joints. Instead, we want to think of those models as not carving nature at its joints, like they're kind of overlapping and capturing different things. And so the account of physics model is literally just looking at things like, you know, the distribution of income, right? The sort of the mating is looking at just kind of like, you know, who is marrying whom as a function of education level, right? Um, so what you want to think about then is, is in some sense constructing ensembles of models that are looking at sort of different dimensions. Now there's a, here's, here's where I'm 
optimistic, but there's a lot of, I think, fascinating work to be done. If I construct ensembles of models, let's take a random forest sort of approach, looking at different data sets. And if they look at these different, looking, if they're looking at different sort of variables, so they're simple decision trees. We have nice theorems and these like boosting algorithms and stuff that show these ensembles can predict really, really well, even though each tree is simple, but that's prediction. What we want to do here is we want to design systems. We want to come up with interventions. And so the question is, is there some sort of analog of ensemble theory, right, for design and for intervention? And so sort of getting back to your question in terms of which data sets do you look at, in some sense, I think you want to think about what's all the data we currently have. And then I think, you know, as my mom would have said, you know, people like Luis are doing kind of like the Lord's work in creating new data sets, right? Because if we have more data sets and then we have more models looking at different parts of those data sets, then I think we can, you know, get something like an ensemble theory of intervention. But you're right, each one of those is looking at, you know, is looking at very, very different sets of things. So like Stiglitz stuff is looking at kind of like, to what extent is your pay insulated? Let's look at the, let's differentiate people by whether their pay is insulated from the market or not. And then let's look at kind of the increases in their pay, right? So each one of these is kind of, you know, think of a house with many windows. Each one has got the shutters down and a whole bunch of those windows. Thank you. There was an extra. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Oh, no, just one. Okay. So I will give you the floor right now. Yes, hi. Thank, thank you for summarizing all these these uh, models and effects. So from the pictures you showed, it, I have the impression that uh, the way you are modeling mathematically is somehow assuming some linear feedback or some linear relationship between these variables. And as a consequence, if you want to achieve uh, twice uh, the outcome, you need twice the intervention. And I'm wondering, uh, and I understand it's a, a simplification yeah. in this setting, but I'm wondering in which extent uh, uh, this is uh, a good uh, modeling approach or whether there are not nonlinear effects that could maybe a hint on, on interventions that can have a nonlinear consequence where we could maybe through uh, negative loops or nonlinear uh, instabilities, bifurcations, we, one could not uh, reverse uh, uh, tendencies with very little interventions <laughs> if, if any of these effects appear in more sophisticated models, if that is relevant at all. No, I think this is a this is a, a great point, right? And I what what I was trying to do with this work is, you know, Rob and I have been trying to go out separately, but also occasionally together and just get people to try and understand systems effects. And my impression was, is that equations aren't a good way <laughs> to do that, right? Nor are, nor are just pictures with cogs. And so what I tried to do is just, I wanted to, for fun, just try and create some simple visualizations that people could understand kind of like how systems effects aggregated and how they made and how they created robustness. To your point, if I made, if I were able to have much more accurate data and fit a model better in terms of like, you know, what's really driving these things, then there is the possibility of identifying lever points. So a, a really good example is there's a, a TED talk involving the, there's a famous complexity graph, you know, one of the spaghetti graphs on Afghanistan, like where it shows all the things interconnected in Afghanistan, it looks a lot like the obesity graph. And this physicist basically said, well, look, let's look at the things that we actually can change, right? Because some of those things you can't change at all. And then you can look at sort of which two or three places would I have to go and intervene in in order to have an effect. Relatedly, like John Miller has this wonderful paper called ANTS, Active Nonlinear Testing, where he takes the World 3 model of population growth and says, okay, where would I have to intervene in order to you know, have the largest effect. So you're absolutely right. If one could construct a, a better model, a richer model, and I think, again, you th and this is, I mean, it's a, a wonderful question because it's getting to my question of ensembles of design. So let's, I think this is an, a fascinating open question. Should I construct one big model that's perfectly accurate and then look for, as, as accurate as I can get, and then look for sort of like, can I do some sort of like, you know, intervention based on these nonlinear terms or should I be constructing ensembles of models that kind of overlap? I love the, the metaphor of kind of like a Markov blanket where I'm kind of like, I've got a blanket covering different parts and I'm trying to cut out parts that maybe met a little bit less, but I've still got enough overlap. And then looking at interventions that seem to be working across a variety of those models. Um, I think that's an open theoretical question. We've done 
because AI has been so focused on prediction, we know a lot more about using ensembles to make good predictions. My gut and, a and also all the science based on predictions suggests there's got to be a parallel ensemble theory of design and a, an ensemble theory of intervention. And I think that, you know, people have, you know, people like yourself who have training in physics and systems are probably going to be people that are going to lead that. And it's exciting, right? Because I think the possibility to, to come up with really useful policies is very, very high and much higher than if I'm running a regression and looking what I call like big coefficient thinking in my book. I think big coefficient thinking is the wrong way to go when you have a system. By that, I mean looking for the, you know, running regression, looking for where the big coefficient is and spending your money there. All right. Well, it's, thanks, Scott. You're right. You want to look for the big levers. <laughs> okay. So our next speaker is Hailan Hu, who is a neuroscientist um, and is going to be telling us about uh, social hierarchies, I think. So quite a different uh, set of data um, and hopefully 